There are moments in life that you'll never forget. Memories you'll pass on to your children, and they'll pass on to theirs. They'll be talked about when friends come together as myth, lore, and legend. These are Tales from the Tailgate. guys welcome back to the show this is steve and as always i am joined by my good buddy trev trev how are you oh i'm doing well steven well I, i'm telling you it's kind of weird we haven't done one of these in a little bit we're trying to get caught back up but i think we're taking this one with know what style. to say yeah <laughs> i didn't even know what to say i was it was a little i was a little off offbeat on that one there and that's all right because we're just going to turn this bad boy over to our guest and let him walk us through something absolutely incredible who do we have today? That's right. We got our good buddy, the man, talk about it, Alex. What's up, brother? What's going on, guys? Pleasure to be here once again. This is the first repeat for me. <laughs> <laughs> that just means we liked you the first time. <laughs> Dude, it's equally, equally uh, the same admiration because you both, uh, I, I talk to Trevor a lot. I don't get to talk to Steven as much. Oh, but... I intentionally didn't talk to you. I didn't want any details about this thing until you put it on here. He didn't give me no details. That's the greatest part about this. Good man. No, no details. I was like, you got to save it for the show. As soon as you asked me about it, I was like, man, I cannot wait to get on here and talk with you guys. So, well, man, why don't we break it right into camp, dude? Let's, let's get on this tailgate and let's talk about it. So, um, you know, I, I talk about it outdoors. I, I got to do what I you did there. <laughs> out from the boys. You know, we, uh, we've been talking about this stuff so much this year, um, even more so. I think there was a vibe around it going into Illinois for 2021 with uh, the podcast. You you know as well as anybody, um, Trevor, the, the podcast vibe is has a whole different feel to it. So going into this year, I told them, I said, I, I told them at the beginning of the season that, I wanted it to be something special, and, and it always is when you get an opportunity to go on a trip, but this year just had something special about it, and uh, it, it definitely was. Going to Illinois, for me, is my favorite hunt. I don't I don't look at any other hunt that I go on throughout the year as much as I do this one because it's the prep work, and Cody and I put so much into going up there, and we have so much fun with it, and this year was no different than last for me. It was this. It was just the equally uh, opportunistic uh, journey. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So, who went up there with the tri- on the trip with you? So, Cody um, and his son Caden actually went with us this year. Cody um, and I started going in uh, twenty nineteen, or excuse me, twenty eighteen together for the first time to Illinois. We made a decision last year if we had the opportunity to bring his son, Caden, along. He's 15, that we were going to take him with us and let him experience the Midwest for the first time. And he asked me if I cared, and I was like, absolutely not. I love the kid. I've known him his whole life. He's like he, – I call him my nephew. I don't even call him Cody's son. I call him my nephew. And um, we went, and I tell you, man, right out of the gate, Illinois was on fire for me without question. So you killed an absolute magnum of an eight-pointer, bro. Why don't you take us through the day and how it all started for you from the minute that you got in Illinois? So we got to Illinois Saturday around lunch, and we went in and hung our sets. We're hunting public land. Um, Cody had a piece of private land that he was going to get to hunt. It was a small track, and I wasn't going to intrude on there. I wanted him and his son to have a journey there together and kind of experience it. And it was a really nice piece of private and it would get crowded with three people. So I went back to the same exact tree that I was in last year when I shot my buck, hung my set, got in and immediately within 15 minutes in the tree, I had a couple of bucks run by chasing a doe. So I knew I was in the right area again and I knew I was in the right spot. So I saw nine bucks on Saturday afternoon chasing three different does. And I knew the bedding that was to the to the east of me. We had a south southwest wind. I was set up perfect for the hunt. I didn't go in there intentionally thinking I was going to see those bucks, but I went in there with the idea that okay, this wind is not blowing into the bedding area. There's no telling what could be in there with some does. So Saturday evening, right off the rip, we had an amazing evening. I did. Cody and Caden saw some nice deer, just didn't get a shot on anything. 
go into Sunday morning. It was the coldest day we had all the time we were there. Um, it was 37 degrees, which is unseasonably warm and green for Illinois. I mean, you right. guys know how the Midwest is, and, and I'm sure it was the same for y'all in Ohio. The greenery blew my mind. Blew my mind. I've never seen it that green and that many standing crops, and I was really worried about that going into it. But, I mean, it was it was the right place to be for me on, uh, <laughs> on Monday. Absolutely. So what happened, man? Take us in. Let's go. <laughs> he, he's got us just See, sitting on it, the cliff, just like, yeah, all right, I'm going to push you, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh sunday morning i see a giant six by five um beautiful buck he's with a doe he heads south uh never to be seen again probably no telling where the deer came from no telling where he's going and all of the deer are moving on a trail about 45 yards from me every deer i saw except for one small eight pointer moved down that same trail and in my mind i'm thinking i really need to push into this bedding area a little bit further but I got nervous because of the wind coming out of the south. It would blow across the front part of that bedding area. And I, I didn't want to push in yet. And the one thing about me is if I get too aggressive, I'll get overly aggressive. If I ever start making those steps, I'll push in too far immediately. So I didn't want to push myself to that because I will. I know me and I will push further than I need to right out of the gate. So I sat tight. I'm on the outside edge of it. One key thing, though, that I did on Saturday, as soon as I got in, I took – and shout out to Jason over at Nose Down Sense. I, I, I used his sense this year, and I wanted to try them. And I made two mock scrapes that within 20 minutes of being in the stand on Saturday afternoon, I had a – I mean, a, probably a 16, 17-inch wide eight-pointer come in and check that scrape right out of that bedding area. So I'd made those mock scrapes, and I had deer coming in and checking them, and the mistake I made, I didn't hang a camera on those scrapes. I just left my camera where it had been all summer back deeper into the bedding because I didn't want to go in there messing around. So I had no idea what was coming and checking those scrapes that night on Saturday. Sunday evening, I did not see but one doe. And so it kind of didn't knock the wind out of my sails, but it made me think, all right, something's going on here. This morning, the temperature's being in the 70s during the day. This is going to be a morning drive for me. So I didn't push any further in i've sat tight where i was at monday morning rolls around and and i gotta go into sunday night because in deer camp if i pitch a drunk if i pull a good drunk if i get 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 my drink on the next morning it seems like i'm gonna kill a good deer and that's exactly what i told cody josh and caden because josh came up on sunday night and hunted with us and uh i put my Tink 69 hat that I've killed every deer except for one since 2010 on. And I told him, I said, boys, tomorrow's the morning. I'm getting drunk tonight. I'm going to drink <laughs> some snops. I'm going to have a good time. So I did. And, and I got up at three o'clock the next morning with a pounding headache thinking, why at 35 years old am I still doing this stuff? <laughs> okay. So real quick, I got to stop because this, this actually came up when we were in Ohio. We saw Tinks in glass bottles. I was yeah. like, you can't find those anywhere. I almost bought all of them. You should have. Gosh, and I, you sent I was me like, one. It's like those, that's that's the real. And mm -hmm. uh, as soon as you said you brought that Tink's hat out, I was like, yep, I'm not alone. So they put I them thought, in big squeeze bottles now. Yeah, now. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're the same it's color, squirt. but they're It's got stupid. a little squirt top on it. <laughs> yeah, it's stupid. It's, Dumbest it's thing ever. It's not the glass Tink's. It doesn't work the, the thing same. with the glass tinks is you would always get the shit on you because it was miserable trying to get it out of the glass bottle. So you smelt like it all day long. Yeah, yeah it was scent cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That Tink 69 hat I bought at a Kmart in 2006, seven, somewhere around in there. And it doesn't hold any other meaning to me other than that's my hat. I love hats. I have a, dozens and dozens of hats. But when I'm ready to kill something, Put that old Tink 69 hat on in this game old. Nice, nice. I don't blame you. All you right. have to have that hat, the killing hat. So you got the, yeah, you're up at three in the morning. You got a splitting headache. You got the right hat on now. You've been drunk the night before. Like you've done all the pregame checks. It is over with. <laughs> so we, we know something big's going to happen. Why don't you roll us into that? So I got up um, at three o'clock. I woke up Cody and, and his son, Caden and Josh around 345, told him, guys, you know, it's time to go. We need to get in the woods. And we're driving 30 minutes to get to the property we're at. I've got 
right at a, I would say, 1,600-yard walk to get to my tree. Okay. I've got a really long walk, but – I've got a friend of mine that lives up there. He lives two hours north of where we hunt. And I met him last year on this piece of public ground. And he's somebody that his name's Bill Trowler. And he's somebody that I've really gotten to know very well. And Bill had texted me the night before. He's like, hey, I'm going to hunt uh, the water tower in the morning. Are you going to be there? I said, yeah, I'm going to be there. He said, cool, I'll meet you at the parking spot. So dropped off Josh, dropped off Caden. Cody drove separate to go hunt another piece pull into the parking place and Bill's got a bike. He's got a rad bike. So he <laughs> unloads his bike and here I am getting ready to tote all my gear in and have to walk in. So right. he's in front of me and he, he goes down the path that we're going to walk, um, that I'm walking in and I hear a deer run through the woods and I see Bill turn around on his bike and he comes back and he says, dude, that was a shooter. He said, probably 140 plus deer. He said, I don't know exactly how big he was big deer though. And I was like, well, all right, cool, they're out. You know, we know we got one in here we can hunt, so let's go to it. So get in the tree, get set up, and this is around 520, 525, something like that when I sit down. Daylight breaks at 540, so I'm seeing the day wake up. I don't see a deer till 8 o'clock that morning. Mm -hmm. First deer I see is just a small, I don't know, 70, 80-inch eight-pointer. Filmed him, got some amazing footage of him. Sun was coming up, you know, and – I'm in the moment, you know, I'm enjoying that. And, and you guys know from me talking to you, especially Trev, this is the first year for me really filming. So I'm taking it all in, you know, I'm trying to run that camera and, and enjoy it and see everything I want to see, go through the motions, you know, getting some great footage, have some does come through about 815. And they came down that same trail I told you guys about earlier. And I'm beating myself up at this point. I'm like, I've got to move closer. So I take my phone out and I text Bill and I'm like, dude, when I get down, I'm moving 40 yards closer so I can be right on top of this trail. These deer are skirting me and put my phone back and it goes off. And I look at it and Bill said, if they're not coming to you, you got to go to them, Alex, LOL. And I kind of giggled and I put my phone down and I look up and I see the deer coming. He's at <laughs> 70 yards and closing. And I'm like, the trail he's on is coming from the east, walking due west. And I, I immediately stand up, grab my bow, and I flipped on my main camera, got it to where I knew he was going to try to go to, and flipped on my GoPro, got it running, and he walks behind a cedar tree. I draw, and this is all in like 12 seconds. I would say 10, 12 seconds, this all goes down. So I draw when he's behind the cedar tree, and I'm going to back up right here before I tell you guys about releasing that <laughs> shot, because you both know the story about what I went through last year and, and blowing my hand up. And I honestly, at this moment, this is the first deer besides the one I shot in early season in Georgia and didn't find that I've actually drawn on. It's the second deer I've drawn on since I blew my hand up. And I thought my bow hunting career was over. Now at the moment, that stuff's not going through my mind, but I, I had practiced so much with this new bow that I've got. I lock in and he walks behind an op he walks through an opening and I, I never looked at his horns and something that I've always prided myself in, if I say shooter and I know that's a deer I want to kill, it's game on. Oh my goodness. Did we freeze again? No, nope, nope, you're good, you're back buddy. To normal. <laughs> it froze up for a second. So he goes through the opening and I see another one. I'm at full draw. I never looked at the cameras again. The hell with the cameras. I'm, I'm not even focusing on that but he stops behind one branch and it's got a V in it. And I'll never forget as long as I live, I settled into that V and when I touched it off, I don't think I've ever felt better about a shot. I mean, I just, I watched it hit him, tears out like a rocket goes through a brush pile across a ditch, runs over the hill and you'll have to go over to our YouTube channel and hear the sound of the video and, and listen to it. He it sounds like he plows into a, a, a brick wall where this deer hit. I had a camera hanging all summer long. He falls in the exact trail that I had my trail camera hanging since July. Is, I had, is it, was it active? I moved the camera the day before. Oh, no. <laughs> No, Never you got the it. pictures would have been insane. Would have, dude, because it went right by. I mean, and there's a log laying there. And honestly, 
heart punched. I mean, I've got pictures. I, it went right through the center of his heart. I blew it out. And he hit that log, and it catapults him 20 feet over into the edge of the woods. And it would have had the whole thing in a sequence of pictures, him running in, had I not moved that camera. So, Damn, that's crazy, though. So I call, you know, you shoot something, what do you do? You pick up the phone. You're like, oh, my God, I got to call somebody. Cody's always the first person I call. He's been my hunting buddy for a lot of years. I didn't call Cody first this time, though. I called Bill. And I felt like Bill was the person I needed to call because he was right over the hill. He was close to me. I'd been texting him all morning. I tell him, I'm like, dude, I just shot a stud. I, I mean, this is a stag. I don't know how big he is, but he's big. So we're excited. We're talking. I FaceTime Cody, of course, chat with him, call my wife, call my dad, call Nick. You know, I'm telling them. And I'm on the phone with my dad and I'm like, hey, let me call you back when I get on the ground. I see my arrow. My arrow's laying just past where I hit him. And I look, and it looks clean. I get my binos up and I look, it's clean. There is no blood on the fletchings whatsoever. And I'm like, oh my God, I've missed this deer. And I've just called everybody and told them I've killed a great buck. <laughs> I go down that tree, boys. I don't think my feet touch the step the whole way down. I missed two eighters right down my sticks all the way to the ground, run over there. What it was, it went in. And, and when he went to run, he broke my arrow. I'm only shooting 60, uh -oh. 60 two pounds right now and it broke my arrow so i'm like oh god thank god i'm good i'm i'm fine there's no worries here i'm good on this shot so wait on them i climb back up get all my stuff together cody and them come over and you know i've been shooting grim reaper broadheads for a long time and for me that's the broadhead of choice that's my head i love shooting them and you know we're partnered up with them and I, I did that because I believe in them. I believe they're the broadhead for me. They shoot better for me than anything that I've ever shot. And it absolutely annihilated this deer. And blood trail was perfect, 60 yards. We walk up and I see him laying there. And I think, I don't see his threes. And I'm like, this is the biggest six pointer I've ever shot in my entire <laughs> life. Surprise. <laughs> Yeah, of course, he's not a six-pointer. Um, and, uh, man, I tell you, as soon as I picked him up, I knew he was the biggest buck I'd ever shot with my bow. Absolute first Pope and Young I've ever shot with my bow. Of course, last year I shot one with a crossbow that went 139, and this year this one's the biggest one I've ever shot with my bow. And what a moment, you know. That's him. wild. I've got him right here. So, oh, he's a stud. Most people can't see him, but, I mean – He's got 24 and a half and 25 inch beams, um, you know, 12 inch twos. He carries his mass all the way out. And this is the cool thing though, going out of state, you guys know this, you have to cape them off the skull in a yep. lot of state before you tape it, take it out. I went and learned how to do that for my taxidermist this year. And uh, one of the coolest experiences ever was taking that deer back, caping him out, putting all my meat in the cooler and being able to take him all the way down, wrap that hide up, and being done. I have horns now that I can carry wherever I want to until my taxidermist calls and says he's ready for them. And that's my that's my tailgate that's tale. Sick, and I, literally, I literally sat on the tailgate and got to tell that story in Illinois to my buddies. I mean, so. I'm and what that's what it's, it's about. all about. Oops. You took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> no, you took them out of my mouth. <laughs> that's incredible so what was like the first thought when you seen him on the ground and you walked over to him um i i i, I kind of said this before when i when i killed my deer last year that i was back you know getting in the woods and getting to take a deer this year it was different because it mm -hmm. was with my bow and i'm such a passionate bow hunter i love it i love bow hunting more than anything you guys love it you know how it is as a bow hunter those thrills and adrenaline moments for me it was that accumulation of everything going through my head i wanted to call my dad you know and facetime my dad when i found him and i'm like look at this joker you know because me and my dad hunt a lot together still we still go on trips together and i'm blessed enough to have him with me still thank god and it was just one of those moments that's the one thing that went through my head but on the video you'll you'll see when 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 i get it done um i sat in the tree after afterwards and i didn't know the deer was down i had a good inclination that he was down but i sat in the tree and i recorded it and i had a great friend of mine he lived up in in the 
I, I want to say it was Maine, but it could have been a little for maybe in Maryland. I'm not sure where Paul lived, but he passed away from cancer this year. And I only met Paul one time, but for the last 10 years, he and I have been friends talking on the phone. And last year I texted him a picture as soon as I found my deer and everything. And that's what went through my head. Mr. Paul went through my head. He was a 30 year army veteran, just an amazing deer hunter, just an amazing man of God. And Paul wasn't there for me. And I, I looked at that moment. That's the one person I thought of a lot was, was Mr. Paul. And I thought about buddies that have went on, you know, that aren't here anymore and just thought about my children, how blessed I am to have my kids and how blessed I am to have my wife at home. And, you know, people talk about that stuff, but that raw emotion in that moment, dude, it was, it was, the, to me, there's never been a moment for me in the deer woods killing that deer that meant as much as that moment. Well, and I can only imagine, especially going through what you went through last year and then finally being able to draw the de- draw a bow on a big deer and it, uh, something that you thought you would never be able to do again mm-hmm. or have a very tough time doing it without some type of, uh, you know, without some type of help of doing so. That's right. Yeah. And it was, I mean, then that's, I've talked about that a lot and I don't want, I'm not saying it to, for anybody to think pity of me or anything else. Mm-hmm. Cause there's folks that go through way worse than I would ever imagine going through. And, and I never wanted any of that, but it was an opportunity for me to find myself coming back. And they talk about an olive tree. You have to trim that olive tree back to make it grow stronger. And I honestly think that knocked my legs out from under me and put me in a position where I had to come back stronger and I want to come back. And I tell that story a lot because I want people to understand there's always someone out there worse shape than you are. Go do it. Just go, just go in the moment. Don't, don't think about what you can't do. Think about what you can do. And for me, I wouldn't have never been able to do it without the friends around me. You know, Cody right there beside me the whole way, Nick right there beside me the whole way. And then I I killed a stag, man. I mean, I was, I was just (laughs) ecstatic, you know, it was great. That's How awesome. was it in camp when you had by, got back to camp? So I'm the, I like to do things my way. I want to do them. I have a very specific routine of cleaning a deer, dressing a deer. And Cody's like, you know, I want to get back in the woods because deer were running like crazy. And I told him, and I, he's going to kill me for saying this, but I told him, I said, buddy, go to the woods. He's like, well, I want to help you. I said, all right, you got one of two choices. You either go to the woods and hunt and enjoy your evening, or you stand here and listen to me bitch about you not helping me the way that you want me to help. He's like, I'm going to the woods. <laughs> <laughs> nope, I know that. And, and that's that's how it is. You have your way. This is how you like to do it. You're comfortable with it, and it's smooth. So you do it. I Took totally time, get that. I, I did it. I mean, and I wanted him caped out perfect because – my taxidermist knows when he gets a deer from me, it's going to be in the best shape it can get in. I'm going to take my time with it. I'm not going to rip him up. I'm going to take it. And I'm, that's just me. And I mean, I just, I just love doing that, that whole process. And I drug out my old case knife and and I've cleaned so many deer with that knife. And we were fortunate enough to give Caden, uh, I had given Cody a knife just like the one that I have last year. And I gave, we, we together gave Caden one and, that whole accumulation of that week, they didn't get to take a deer, but they were there with me when I took my biggest at this point in my career, and we were able to give him a knife that kind of, you know. Yeah, maybe it signifies the hot. event. Yeah. It absolutely did. And, yep. and that's yep. the beautiful thing about hunt camp is it doesn't matter who kills. Anybody kills. It's a celebration. Everyone has a good time. I mean, Trev's last year, that was an absolute blast. Eric's this I, year, that was a blast. It was an amazing I mean, time. Doesn't matter about the size of the deer or where the deer was or anything. Someone at camp got a deer in a very hard earned situation. You have a good time. Yep. And I think that's all, you know, you, you hear me on talk on our show about, you know, mounting the memories. And I, I say that, and that's the one thing I, I'm going to mount this deer. And it's, I will look at that deer from here till the, till the, he's no longer here. I'm no longer here as an opportunity and a moment in time etched by that mount. That mount means the memory. The deer doesn't mean anything to me. The, to, mm-hmm. I'll take, throw the deer in the river, as far as I'm concerned, as long as I can relive that moment in my mind until the end of, you know, end of my time. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. And that's what it's all about. 
that's really what it's honestly all about because everything that you do even a you know as simple as a turkey fan on the wall or any anything i mean it, you the memories that go behind it there's a reason why that it's like a memorial and you i i live by that what you say mount the memories i talk about it all the time to everybody like it's it's i live by that i mean it's 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 an amazing thing and it's so true and i'm everybody should live by it honestly well because you're never going to have those opportunities the 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 deer will fade it will get dust on it but when you look at it you can knock that dust off in your mind and know exactly where you were in that exact moment and who was there with you and it doesn't matter if it's a deer a turkey a squirrel a a shotgun shell on the wall that means something to you you take yourself back to those moments and i'm telling you man through through this podcast we've been able to hear some amazing stories just like what you told on ours trev just like what you've told on ours steve in those moments it's just a way of mounting it a podcast is a way of sharing those memories and and telling those stories and i don't know it's it's, it's been a blessing we're coming up on a year and the last year I, I never would have met you guys any other way and and for the friendship that we've been able to develop and what we're going to do in camp in the future whether <laughs> nope, we're that's going to have some serious memories <laughs> you know, well <laughs> we'll either mount memories we might... or we're going to make some one way or the yeah. other <laughs> it's going to get wild I, I say it like this we're going to spend time in camp with uh you know making memories with friends that we'll never forget i'll tell you that much uh -huh, <laughs> you know? for I mean, sure it's, that's the truth. I mean, we might not memorize everything, but we're definitely not going to forget well, the friends we spent it with. We, we may want to forget a few things, but yeah, let's be right. honest. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> There's been a few times I've wanted to forget stuff for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's camp, man. That's why that's we camp, do it. Man. It's what and we I live for. That's the best part of it. So, you know, like I said, it's, it's y'all have the tales of the tailgate. We have our little campfire series that we do, and it's just, I don't know. It's, it's just so much fun. And there's so much in it that if you don't live it and you're not living this lifestyle, you'll never understand it. And I feel sorry for people like that. I really do because it doesn't matter what deer gets taken. Like you said, Trevor, it doesn't matter the size. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a moment and they're never going to get to live that. And I feel sorry for them. I really do. People that don't understand this lifestyle, I honestly feel sorry for them because they're really missing out on one of the greatest blessings of life well that's why we do what we do and we can go ahead and table the pity right there because they can come find it anytime right here that's right that's so, right i just want to thank you for jumping on here and sharing that tale and making sure that uh, maybe one day someone will stumble across it and it'll make that difference and they'll go out there and learn to experience it for themselves well, I can't thank you guys enough. You know, the friendship that we've been able to build just through a podcast, it goes way deeper than that because I can promise if people don't if people don't know you guys, they're they're missing out because they're <laughs> they're gonna find a great thing when they find you guys show. Well, same goes for y'all. Man, it's been fun and it's all been uh a great big circle. Uh who knows what's gonna come in the future, but it's gonna be fun. That's all <laughs> I can say. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Well, again, thank you for sharing your tale. And everybody, make sure to uh, check out, talk about it. Go see their, listen to their show, follow along, get on their YouTube, take them a, uh, a good long look at the story because he's got it all on film. And I'm, I'm proud he took that self-filming roll up because it ain't easy. But now he's got that story to look back on, both memory and physically. So check them out. And uh, until then, go ahead and just stay tuned for the next Tales from the Tailgate. <laughs>